Did the Prophet Muhammad copy the Bible? Did he write the Quran himself? Did he lay claim to prophethood for fame, power and status? Did he even exist? Accusations against the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, are nothing new and they've been around since the advent of his prophetic mission. The Quran captures his detractors labeling him a poet, a magician and even a madman. Yet in the modern world of aggressive skepticism, doubt and hyper evangelicals hell-bent on disproving Islam, how can we truly prove the Prophet Muhammad was in fact a prophet? Joining us today all the way from Pennsylvania, USA is Sheikh Muhammad al shinnawi an Imam, researcher and author of the book The Final Prophet, Proof of the Prophethood of Muhammad. We ask him all the difficult questions and this is how he responded. Why do we need a prophet? That's a good question. Because we can't all be prophets. <laughs> Before we get into the questions, if you're enjoying this content and all the other content that One Path Network produces, please support us, create more. We're currently in the final stages of completing our studio to create bigger and better productions to benefit Muslims all around the world. Please consider going over to our website and contributing whatever you can to support our mission. Jazakallah khairan. Did the Prophet bring any physical signs of prophethood? You see, because the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, unlike the Prophets before him, was intended for all of humanity, the proofs for his prophethood were uh, designed, if you will, or chosen by God with a sense of universality, right? The physical miracles in his lifetime, these are beyond denial, you know, like uh, a reality skeptic or someone, you know, with poor philosophy may think that uh, it's unscientific or irrational to believe in a miracle. But no, if you believe in God, a supreme God who created the universe and sort of the uh, laws of the universe, then it should follow that he is not bound by the laws that he created. So they're possible. Now, are they provable? Even those who don't like Muslims or aren't they're very fond of Islam, but honest, objective, non-Muslim historiographers all agree for the most part uh, that our tradition is unique, tradition of reliable transmission of reports. So it's been traceable to the Prophet Sallallahu so many miracles. And I would even venture to say that all that is overkill. It's irrelevant, meaning there is so much corroboration from an entire generation that these physical miracles were performed that you don't even need to fact check on who said what anymore because colluding on a conspiracy of that magnitude, a lie across a whole generation that's consistent is logistically impossible. So it's beyond any reasonable doubt that he performed these physical miracles. So you have also the prophecies. He foretold the future in ways that are not the ways of the psychics, not the ways of the fraudsters and the imposters. You know, uh, psychics usually speak in like cryptic words, ambiguous, loose statements, uh, and then they like back project to try to back engineer and say, that's what I meant by that sort of uh, riddle. <laughs> he spoke very specifically, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then psychics, even when they try to sort of be loose about it, uh, to cover their bases or, you know, uh, for more lead time on selling their lies, they still get it wrong sometimes, right? He was specific almost always when speaking about the future, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he was never wrong. Things always came about exactly as he said, and some of them will be in the future, have not yet unfolded, but never unfolded contrary to what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. So why is he the final prophet and why are there no prophets after him? Because God said so. <laughs> He's the final prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, because the Quran said uh, he is the seal of the prophets, right? Uh, and why did God choose that he be the seal of the prophets? Because the prophets and messengers are manifestations of God's mercy and desire for humanity to be guided. And so every time a prophet would come and their people would deviate, or they would distort the message, he would send another prophet to refresh uh, or renew or refine the message in a more uh, clear way or a more suitable way because times would have changed across the human experience. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was sent with the Quran and Allah destined that unlike the previous scriptures, which he did not intend to preserve from corruption, the Quran would not be corrupted no matter what. And so what would be the purpose of more prophets later uh, or the wisdom when it's as fresh as the day it came down? 
If every last copy of the Qur'an were gathered and burned and tossed to the wind, you have tens of millions of people all across the globe who memorize it letter for letter by heart. Allah said, rather they are clear signs, clear verses that were saved in the hearts of those who are endowed with sacred knowledge. How do we know he wasn't claiming prophethood for his own worldly gains? That's also a great question and it reminds us to appreciate that this is the most well-documented life in all of human history. His life was an open book, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means room for scrutiny is more available there than anywhere else. You know, it would have shown. I mean, you can trick some people all the time. They're just that naive and gullible. And you might be able to trick everybody for a short period of time, but how do you trick everybody forever? Unheard of. And so pre-prophethood, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam was not just known for his honesty, he was literally titled, nicknamed Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Al-Amin is coming, everyone knew who you were talking about, right? And even when God said to him to go public with the message, he stood on the mountain and he asked everyone, if I were to tell you there was a cavalry of horses behind this mountain about to raid you and kill you all, would you believe me? And they all in unison testify, we've never experienced a lie from you. He said, in that case, then know that God has elected me for this message, this mission. And you know, even post-prophethood, when he faced all the persecution he faced in Mecca, when the day he finally is permitted by God to seek asylum in Medina, where he can remain safe, preach uh, God's guidance to the world, he leaves behind his cousin Ali to return to people their belongings, belongings that are entrusted with him. And you gotta just like stop there for a second. like. You're actively killing my supporters and followers. You've waged war on me, essentially. You've driven me out of my home and you still keep your trusts with me when you travel. Like, that means they all believed that he was incorruptible, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, even when he gets to Medina, so profound, like his son Ibrahim dies, uh, his infant son. And on that same day, the sun eclipses. It goes dark during the daytime. And people just sort of made this connection that, oh, the skies are saddened by the death of the son of the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They made that association from their minds because it was also like a, a superstition that, you know, the sun eclipses for like the birth of a great man or the death of a great man. And so he didn't say this, sallallahu alayhi wa They said this, and yet he exits his home and stands up on the altar, the, the pulpit or the pedestal, and, and he says, oh people, I, it has reached me that some of you are saying X, Y, and Z. The sun and the moon are but two signs of God. They don't eclipse for the death or the life of anyone. He's shattering the misconception. He's grieving, right? He didn't even say it. And he's busied with you know, that tragic loss of his two-year-old, yet he goes out of his way to say to all the people, like if you're in it for self-promotion, right? <laughs> like this would be a very convenient opportunity, credibility booster, right? Just let them say it. He goes out of his way to say they are two signs of God only by which he strikes fear in the hearts of his slaves, meaning a display of his power. God can make the world go dark in a second. So when you see these things, don't glorify Muhammad. He said, when you see these things, you need to get up and pray and give in charity and free slaves. Show your humility before God. Show your brokenness, your recognition of his power until he removes this phenomenon, you know, from the skies above you. So, you know, when you suspect someone, you say like, what's the motive? What's in it for them? What did they get out of it? What did he get out of it? Our mother Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was once asked what were your living conditions like? And she said a moon and then a moon and then a moon, meaning three full moons, three full months would pass over us and no fire would be lit in the house of the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Like this is the head of state. <laughs> People would almost obsessively, you know, want to do things for him. Uh, and he would resist, right? Uh, and they would say to her, but no fire means like no cooking. No cooking means no meat. Like what would you guys eat? She said, we would survive on the two readily available things in Medina, water and dates, unless, this is an exception, unless some of his companions gifted him a jug of milk. 
How do we know he didn't write the Quran for himself? All experts on the Quran, past and present, Muslim and non-Muslim, they all agree that the Quran is absolutely in a league of its own. There's nothing that comes close to it. Inimitable, linguistically. Matchless in terms of its composition. There's no disagreement there. They only disagree on supernatural or not, okay? But considering just that layer of it, how could Muhammad have produced it, sallallahu alayhi wa right? That's just language. This is a man who was well known to not be involved in any sort of poetry. Never say a couplet of poetry in his life. The poets were known. People would only have feasts, like when you know a chief was born or a poet rose to power. <laughs> and uh, he never was involved in any of this. He could not read and write. His whole society could not read and write. How could he bring this forward? They would have had a shred of doubt had he been literate. That's what the Quran says. That's one verse. The other verse, you know, says that th they claim he got this from another person because that is the claim, no, he couldn't have produced this. They claim he got this from another person, uh, and this other person was giving him biblical accounts, biblical information. So that's problematic, why? As the Quran says, لِسَانُ الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ أَعْجَمِي وَهَذَا لِسَانٌ عَرَبِيٌ مُبِينٌ That the language that they're saying he plagiarized from is non-Arab, and this is a clearly Arabic Quran. So hey you, stop, stop changing the subject. That's what the verse is saying <laughs> in New York terms. <laughs> uh, why are you changing the subject? We said linguistically matchless. Even if we're gonna agree for argument's sake, hypothetically, your distraction about he got it from somewhere else, that's only the source. You still haven't answered about the end product. How does it come out in this immaculate form, okay? Then the third ayah goes on to say, لَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ عُمْرًا Allah knows that they say you got it from someone else. إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرًا Another human being teaches him. But I have remained with you for a lifetime. How in the world would he become the apprentice of some Bible scholar, right? <laughs> uh, when we all know him. He's been living with us for a lifetime. This would have acquired a lifetime of apprenticeship. This is the, he took care of shepherds on the hills of Mecca. He took care of sheep as a shepherd on the hills of Mecca. He went on a few trade expeditions. When and where exactly did he become this studious person who knew other languages and had access to like these long since lost manuscripts? And those manuscripts were where? Like in Arabia of all places? And How did all this happen? Uh, that would require a dual lifetime that no one knew about. And so it becomes cynical to believe in a conspiracy of that magnitude. And so these are some of the Qur'anic answers as to how he could not have written it. Even, you know, the Qur'an speaks about, they say, how come you can't bring the Qur'an all at once? You know, part of the, the beauty of the Qur'an not coming down all at once is that it shows you no maturation in the language of the Qur'an. Meaning, if I wrote something today and wrote something else 23 years later, there should better be a difference in quality or else I haven't learned anything in 23 years, right? And yet the same airtight, perfect, nuanced, sophisticated language that you have at the end revelations, you have in the first days of revelation. How? How can someone in sort of kindergarten or KG or something produce something at the same level of what they wrote for their PhD thesis? Did Muhammad just take from the previous scriptures such as the Bible? As we said earlier, it causes more problems than it solves to attribute the content of the Qur'an to the Bible. And maybe some examples now uh, will help. Think of the concept of the historical account of Pharaoh. Nobody knew anything about the Pharaoh of Egypt except what the Bible said, save for about 200 years ago, when sort of Napoleon conquers Egypt, the vaults are open, hieroglyphics are deciphered, you know, the, the language, the science of Egyptology is born, and then you start unpacking these things. So for 1,200 years after the Prophet Sallallahu and hundreds of years before him, it's all lost. We have an account in the Bible, yet you find some very interesting variations, just in that, you know, one facet about how the Bible speaks of Pharaoh and how the Quran speaks of Pharaoh. You know, the Qur'an, for example, says Pharaoh will be preserved, not just drowned. The Bible doesn't mention that he would be preserved. So uh, this is a risk 
the Quran is taking. I'm using skeptic terms, right? And yet that was right. The Bible goes on to say uh, that the king of Egypt in the time of Abraham is called Pharaoh. The king of Egypt in the time of his great grandson Joseph is called Pharaoh. The king of Egypt in the time of Prophet Moses, peace be upon them all, is called Pharaoh. So if the Quran is plagiarizing, it would plagiarize that as well. But yet very carefully, as Maurice Bukai says, like the word choice is just thought provoking. It says Pharaoh 64 times in the Quran, but all of them in the story of Moses, refuses to mention them in the story of Abraham and Joseph. And you go open Encyclopedia Britannica today, you realize a number of things. Of them is that it could not have been correct to call them the Abrahamic Egyptian king or the uh, Joseph's times Egyptian king, pharaohs, because the term didn't exist yet. It only got coined in the 18th dynasty. So the Quran, if it was taken from there, would have made the same historical blunder. And interestingly also, even if the term existed, it would have still been wrong to use it in the time of Joseph because Pharaoh was a title for the ruler of Egypt from Egypt. And now we know that it was the Hyksos during the time of Joseph, which literally meant foreign kings. They weren't even Egyptians. They were occupiers invading force from Palestine. And so where did he get all this from, sallallahu alayhi wa Except the knower of the unseen, the one with whom past, present, and future are one level plane, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did the Prophet wage war against his opponents? And why does it say in the Quran specifically to be harsh against his opponents? I'm very offended by the question. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, so a simple overview of the Prophet's military uh, practices sallallahu alaihi wasallam are very telling so people from a distance can take out of context a verse or a hadith without the bigger picture and then in that case you set yourself up for misunderstanding anything so a simple uh, cursory glance even at his 23 year ministry will contextualize for you all of this i mean principles first the quran said you know if they incline to peace, then you incline to peace and put your trust in, in God. That peace can be a reality and there can be new beginnings. So the idea of Islam requiring warfare and jihad means being bent on world global domination and all of this. And it's contrary to so much, right? Uh, and all the verses that could be misconstrued are nothing but that, cherry picked out of context. So let's look now at his life. 13 years in Mecca, his call is resisted for the most part by the majority of his uh, contemporaries and or the most powerful of them and then persecution begins. So he is commanded by God to not even defend himself because there would be greater harm in that and eventually he was told you may migrate to Medina for uh, safe refuge. He gets to Medina two years into that, so 15 years into his ministry He's finally defending himself. God said, permission has been granted to those who are fought. يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا because they have been oppressed. وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير And Allah is certainly capable of defending them. So now it became the duty of the believing people to defend what's right. It's a just war theory, to stand for justice. And so self-defense happened in the Battle of Badr in the second year into Medina, 15 years into the ministry. One year later, the army comes back for revenge and it becomes the Battle of Uhud, once again, self-defense. And then two years later, each time they're coming back with a bigger army, these aggressors, and then the Battle of Ahzab takes place, okay? So now we're talking about 18 years of the 23 years, he's not fighting or he is solely responding to aggression. We're already there. The landslide majority of it is self-defense. After that fifth year in Medina, the 18th year of prophethood, he says, we will no longer wait for them to attack us. Now we will strike them preemptively. And everyone knows that this is how you protect yourself. You don't just sit there in the corner, you know, blocking punches. Eventually you're going to have to disarm the aggressor. Someone that has repeatedly shown that they will not stop ag aggressively coming at you, harming the innocent, so long as they have any leverage to do so. So he began to preemptively strike them 
in self-defense, preemptive defense. Like so many countries say, this country has threatened me or this country has, you know, uh, shown us their weapons of mass destruction. That was the premise, right? It's self-defense in, in a preemptive way. So that took place until uh, the Prophet ﷺ became the ruler of Arabia. And then he went on sort of an offensive. What kind of offensive did he go on in a way that defended not just his own interests, but defended the interests of the innocent in adjacent countries, right? It was not force feeding Islam to anyone. It was in fact, as the Quran says, why is it that you don't fight when the women and the children and the oppressed are calling out to God to save them from these tyrannical regimes? And so it was always in response to aggression, aggression against him, aggression against the believers, aggression against sort of the nucleus, that newly formed Muslim community, or aggression against others, because Muslims don't just live for themselves, right? And so it was always in response to hostility and aggression, while peace and seeking peace whenever possible remained the ideal. And his lifetime showed that even at the height of his power, his clemency, his forgiveness, his allowing for new beginnings, his winning over his enemies when he could have easily at that point uh, taken the path of vengeance, which was the norm in his societies, uh, he did not seek those paths. And so it was all a matter of God telling him, you are entitled to defend yourself and you are obligated to defend others when there are tyrannical regimes that don't understand anything but power. So it is not seeking it out, it is a matter of reality, realism. Some people only understand strength, they don't understand ethics or even treaties. The criteria for a prophet is that they have solutions for all of humanity. What are the solutions provided by him in today's context, whether it's social justice or environmental crises? Yeah, I don't think anyone should take lightly the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu has proven Islam's ability to effect true racial equality, for instance, as Malcolm X often argued, may Allah have mercy on his soul. I don't think uh, people should uh, think lightly of the fact that no other system but the truly divine system from God has ever been able, no system has ever been able to effectively remove alcoholism from society, but the Prophet Sallallahu And so the issue is not just about defining morality, it is about how to have a structured application of morality that's actually effective. Because think about it, like everyone really agrees about the destructive nature of alcohol, intoxicants. Ask the World Health Organization, ask any health department anywhere. What happened was we tried to brush all that under the rug when we found ourselves too deep uh, in the dungeon of, <laughs> of alcohol we are no longer able to tame the beast of alcoholism. And so we're trying to mitigate its harms. Like a superpower like the United States had the prohibition acts, tried to remove it, you know, and that failed miserably. Why? Because it wasn't a divine system. You can't just fix this stuff with law, with policing. There has to be accountability before God. You know, the concept of, you know, it ain't wrong if I don't get caught. Well, with God, that's just an irrelevant concept now. It's incoherent. So the Prohibition Acts failed. So they moved on to say, okay, let's move on to encouraging people, new campaign, to drink responsibly. It's just like, what in the world does that even mean? I drink something that impairs my judgment. Uh, and then when I've judged that I've had enough or too much, I stop. And contrast that with Islam. Islam came with accountability before God, above all. And then it says, don't uh, drink a little if a lot will intoxicate you. That's a verbatim hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then you move on to say, okay, so drinking responsibly failed, so let's try a new concept. And the United States imported uh, under what was called the Harvard Alcohol Project from one of the European countries, the designated driver model. Okay, so like when you guys go to a party, one of you guys has to be, <laughs> you know, that guy who doesn't drink the loser of the party essentially, right? In their eyes. And of course that failed miserably because nobody wants to sort of be the one who's not having fun uh, when everyone else at the table is having fun. And so peer pressure doesn't just affect kids, it affects adults just the same. And so the designated driver concept 
failed miserably and it has not even mitigated after 30 years and mass campaigning and flooding it with money and promotion, it hasn't even mitigated half of the deaths, the alcohol-related traffic deaths, just alcohol-related. Aside from the fact that, you know, the amount of newborns it kills and all this other stuff, once again, contrast that with what the Prophet Muhammad did. Peace and blessings be upon him. He said, you don't sit at a table where alcohol is circulated. And so this as a case study is just one of the many models on how holistic well-being and thorough applications of morality require them to be divinely determined, come from God, the actual framework and layout, but also divinely grounded. It has to be built in faith. Like what is the value of faith? Faith gives meaning, right? Faith gives purpose. Faith gives motivation for us to do, if we can even agree on what's right, to do what we know is right. And now all the research is showing us, suicide rates doubling and tripling in the past 50 and 75 years, showing us that having meaning, having purpose is far more valuable towards mental well-being and sort of emotional fulfillment and even social the social fabric. Meaning and purpose outdo luxury and comfort any day of the week. And so all of that is found only in the divine message of the Prophet ﷺ in the past and here and now again.